And this is going to be an exciting program uh, because we have folks from all over the country that are here to share some great ideas from their communities that will help, I think, be able to spur some interest that you may have uh, to look at some things that we can do to make sure that our entire upstate of South Carolina can be the best that it can be. Essentially, how did this start? I was looking for a project for my classes. And uh, I had worked with Dean in the past. I teach classes here at Upstate on uh, urban planning and policy, public administration, public policy, and general political science. And he uh, had told me, uh, Dean had mentioned to me about the exciting work of the uh, Community Vibrancy Task Force. Uh, what they wanted to do was come up with a list of great ideas, ideas that have uh, successfully improved vibrancy of communities around the country. And this sounded to us in a meeting with Nancy like perfect work for students here at USC Upstate. Uh, we decided that this could be their semester long project. So the students were tasked for a semester to find great ideas, to conduct research, to go out and see what people are doing around the country, um, find something that worked, and learn everything they can about it. Um, how did it start? Um, how much did it cost? Where did the money come from? What were some of the challenges? All of these things um, were very, very relevant, we thought, to leaders here in the upstate trying to improve our own communities. The idea being the more we can know about them, the better we can determine whether or not these things apply to us here in the upstate. Um, I want to point out that although this did serve value to uh, community leaders, um, there was an incredible amount of value for my students in this project. Um, they, as an academic exercise, learned about what great ideas can do in communities, how driven people um, can improve the places that they live, and how there are challenges with turning an idea into action. They saw all of that. Um, we're going to hear about some of it today, actually. Um, and that, that was very valuable for them. Um, the best part of all of this was that at USC Upstate, most of our students are from here. Uh, most of our students will stay here. So for them, this was personal. Uh, this was an opportunity to have a seat at the table to help improve the places that they're going to live. And, um, and I can't emphasize that point enough because it really did turn into sort of a personal project for a lot of them. Um, we did this for two semesters. All of their work is compiled in a booklet that I believe will be available later on today. It's certainly on the Ten at the Top website. Um, two final points that I do want to make. Um, the Upstate already has vibrant communities. Um, I noticed that as soon as I moved here. Um, I think that, that Ten at the Top did a study about four or five years ago, and the, the data showed that a lot of people that live here agree with me. But we can always do better, we can always be more inventive, we can always look for more unique projects. So that's where this is. We're starting here uh, really from a position of strength, from my view. Um, secondly, to my, uh, to my speakers that are, not my speakers, to the speakers um, that are here, uh, what I want them to know is that they are not here solely because um, they did outstanding work that did improve the community, even though they did. They're here because they inspired one of my students. Um, they could go wherever they wanted. My students looked everywhere. They found you. Um, and these were 8 a.m. classes, by the way. I want to point that out. <laughs> so, so, so that's not easy to inspire anybody at 8 a.m. But, but nonetheless, um, they, they found you. They spent a semester learning everything about you. Um, and now you're here. Um, so never in my wildest dreams that I think it would turn into something like this. But what I do want our speakers to know is that their work, their good work, extends beyond the boundary of their own community and touched us here in the upstate. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Hi, I'm Jennifer Billstrom. I'm from Black Mountain, North Carolina, and I'm the co-creator of Cycle to Farm. So I'm going to show a quick video that will tell you more about the event. The Cycle to Farm metric century begins and ends in Black Mountain and takes riders 63 miles through Buncombe and McDowell counties. The route for Cycle to Farm is a challenging route. We will cover 4,200 feet of elevation gain, and we will cross the Eastern Continental Divide three times. There's people coming from 11 different states to participate in this ride, and we have folks who are very avid road cyclists, and we have folks who are gonna be riding mountain bikes. 
So there's a very wide variety of people out there. We love to ride bikes, so we just thought it'd be a really neat weekend thing to do. I've probably never ridden more than 10 miles in my whole life. <laughs> and so I started doing the training rides with Jennifer and David, and it was just so much fun, just meeting a group of people and challenging yourself. I was a little worried about my bike um, because it's about 20 years old, but it just worked out great. Um, I didn't buy anything new. I'm just, just winging it with, with what I had. What we're counting on is that, you know, though we haven't trained physically, that uh, the whole spirit of it is going to get us through it. <laughs> so. And it's the spirit of this event that makes it unique. And that's evident even before the ride starts, with free coffee provided by local roaster Dynamite Coffee and sweet potato cakes by New Sprout Farms. So the riders will get to have a little taste of, of the first farm before they even start the ride. A bike mechanic from Liberty Bikes is on hand for those last minute adjustments, as well as certified yoga instructors from Black Mountain Yoga and Karen Body Works to get you stretched and ready to go. They'll be on hand at the end of the ride as well. I think there are many, many rides that are extremely challenging, and those rides are a lot of fun to participate in. This ride is a little bit different in that it will be challenging, yet you will feel pampered because you will get to taste so many nice local foods and experience such a wonderful route and such, and such a well-supported ride. The whole purpose of the ride is to raise awareness of both local foods and to raise money for our greenways in Black Mountain. I love that it supports the greenways and I love to eat so I thought, what better than to go on a bike ride where you could eat the whole way? Stops sponsored by local farms along the route allow bikers to take a break every 10 to 15 miles, get refueled, and sample the products these farms have to offer. This is ground lamb with feta and rosemary and uh, our eggs. We raise chickens also. In addition to sampling, riders can also purchase items from the farms. Those items will be delivered to Black Mountain for pickup at the end of the ride. I enjoyed taking a nice break every couple miles and uh, made the ride a lot more uh, enjoyable than just trying to race through it the whole time. The route actually was the inspiration for the ride. It's just beautiful farm country that we're going to be passing through. Nice challenging hills, but very scenic. It was nice to stop at all the farms and get a taste of things. And everyone was so friendly and happy. We bought food at every farm, so we'll have like a gourmet meal when we get back. <laughs> it was a beautiful day and, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie on the course and you kind of meet new people and it was wonderful. And the pampering continues at the after party with delicious local food. Yeah. music and newfound friends. Black Mountain is just a wonderful place to start and end. I had a great time. It's really, really well organized ride. The course is rigorous, but it's beautiful, beautiful riding, and so I will definitely do it again. This is Derek Long for North Carolina Weekend. So what happens in the community um, when we bring a cycle to the farm? In our inaugural year, Cycle Farm created a $49,000 economic impact for the community. And for this year, our ride will happen in July, and we are anticipating an impact of $85,000. Um, so what does it take to make the event a success? We have 18 sponsors, two of which are at the presenting level, and that's New Belgium Brewing and Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. 300 cyclists burning thousands of calories and being rewarded along the way with tasty treats. About 100 volunteers, nine farms. Uh, this year we anticipate 1,760 farm visits in one day. That's a lot of customers. Some of them are new customers, some of them are old customers, some of, some of them are folks who have traveled a long way and wish they lived in a place where they could get local foods like we have in Black Mountain. And then we need one nonprofit beneficiary. In Black Mountain, that's the Greenways. Other locations that are considering bringing Cycle Farm to their community are considering land conservation and economic development as working causes. So if you're interested in bringing Cycle Farm to your community, see me after the presentation. My name's uh, Carol Woodland, and I'm from Charleston, 
South Carolina. Uh, I work uh, for the Jewish Community Center in Charleston and the Kids Fair event. Um, we have just celebrated our 25th year uh, last March. Uh, on March 5th, 1989, Charleston opened its doors to the uh, Let's Love Family event. Um, it provided uh, a genuine value to Charleston where the kids and their parents profited from a day of fun and learning experiences. Um, one of our board members actually went to Worcester, Massachusetts originally and um, there was a conference there and uh, Kids Fair was highlighted. And I did have a CD, but it's not playing, so. <coughs> and uh, anyway, so um, Sharon, who was an executive board member, brought the project back to Charleston. The board okayed it and 25 years ago we started. Um, the actual mission, it's a annual interactive event held in Charleston to fulfill cultural, social, and economic needs of children and in turn promote a sense of community and strengthen uh, families. We, it's almost like a children, it is, it's a children's trade show. We invite nonprofit booths. We have um, probably about 100 nonprofit booths. We invite them free of charge. And our revenue um, comes from the sponsors. So, um, and actually, the only thing that we really pay for is I have a decorator that doesn't pay the tray, the curtains, and the setup, uh, actually from Savannah. I've worked with him. I've done the event myself for 22 years. So, um, but each year it changes. Uh, each year, um, in the past, we've had different themes um, and different projects. Uh, once you come in, uh, it's made up of five different, six different themes, actually. We've just added another theme. It's kids' health, and we invite exhibits. In other words, everybody has to have an interactive exhibit. The nonprofit booths are usually eight by ten. Uh, sponsors, uh, they can have as much space as they want. Um, again, each, um, each uh, booth centers either on kids' health, kids' safe, Kids Go Green, Kids Smart, Kids Play, and Kids Food. So everyone has to do some sort of interactive activity focusing on one of those themes. Uh, once you're inside, the nice part of it is it's, oh, it's $1 admission. Um, children must be admitted with an adult. Adults must be admitted with a child. No adult can come in by themselves. And uh, it's, it's one dollar, and once you're inside, everything is free. Um, we do, in the past few years, though, have had, but we sell food outside. Um, some of our major sponsors, well, like I said, it's free parking, and again, once you're in, everything is free. Um, we reach about anywhere, I would say, from 10,000 to 12,000 families uh, per year. This past year we had a little, probably about 8,000, we changed venues. We usually do it downtown at the Gilead Auditorium. We keep it downtown because it's a way of bringing in the inner city kids that really can just walk over or ride their bikes over um, rather than have it in a convention center. But then we had it in Gil, um, we partner um, it's presented through the Jewish Community Center in partnership with the city of Charleston. And this year, we, um, it was hosted by the Charleston County School Districts um, District and the Parks and Playground. And we've added all of the recreational areas. Um, they also can promote the event to all the after school. must be 30, 40,000 after school kids and programs. We try to have contests in schools, maybe to um, um, name a mascot or best painting of what Kids Fair means to you. Uh, it's funded again by sponsors. Our major sponsor uh, last year was Publix Supermarkets and Charities. They've been a lead sponsor probably for over 20, well, I think 25 years already. Um, we have a bank. Uh, First Federal was our sponsor. We have TV media in kind, like a $10,000 in kind sponsor. 
We also have a $10,000 radio sponsor. Um, the, we have a contract with the radio sponsor so that they, in turn, also try to get sponsors. So basically, um, the funding is through our sponsorships. Um, it's, it's, it's a volunteer organization. Um, it's almost really a one-man show. One. <laughs> so it's a little hard to do everything. We, you know, um, other JCCs have really made hundred thousand dollars on this project. Um, we do not make. We did not last year make that money, and that was totally because of a lack of really somebody going out and constantly selling the project. This year, however, it's going to be a year-round project. I've already created. Um, our sponsorship brochure. I have people working with me now starting early before budgets are done. And, um, you know, again, it's just the community, it just connects. The whole thing is just connecting. One year it's connecting to our community, connecting to our healthy community, but really it's, it's connecting the resources in our Charleston community to all families and children. Um, People come in, the uh, hospitals, uh, we've had NUSC in the past, you know, different years. Um, they have different booths and they test all kinds of, you know, hearing, they test the eyesight. In, in years we've discovered something really um, wrong, you know, if there was a problem with the child, um, they discovered it, it cost one on the front page of the newspaper at that point. But, um, Again, it's just a wonderful, wonderful activity, and it's also, we involve the whole community. So it's, it's sort of, the, you know, the JCC has their own programs, but again, this is really the one program that we don't really, we have a gala party that we involve our community in for fundraising, but other than that, it's really done um, throughout the community. And the, the proceeds really go to a Camp Baker that we have at the JCC, and anyone who is in a scholarship need, um, we will give them a scholarship and send their children um, to camp for the summer. So, I think, Prizes and also the prizes that they receive 
Um, we do a voting system for a People's Choice Award, and we also do a judges uh, award first and second place during the summer. So we have judges that are um, one from an arts background, one from a bicycling background, um, and also just sort of a regular Joe that has kind of no clue about either one of those. Um, and, and sometimes we have a tiebreaker. We also have a partner uh, organization offer a judge as well so that we have some involvement. Um, we auction the pieces at the end of the summer. Um, they go normally to local uh, local owners. We love driving around Spartanburg and seeing um, past year's art cycles in people's yards. Um, they are outdoor sculptures, as you can see. Um, some of the larger sculptures uh, we have uh, either kept in Spartanburg, Spartanburg or one of them, actually the top one, Yoga Peeps, um, from a couple years ago is actually out in front of the Partners Back to the Living Office. Uh, so we were lucky enough to keep that one um, with us, which is fun. Uh, and this other one will actually be put on the Mary Black Foundation Rail Trail at some point as well. So some of them that do not sell an auction, we get to keep as uh, the city of Sparkburg and really in keep that ongoing vibrancy of public art and uh, combining our, our two loves as it's come to, uh, as I've come to see it as art and bicycling um, here in Sparkburg. So it's been uh, a great project and um, a pretty easy one to run. Um, and the city is extremely supportive of it. So we've worked with them very closely on all of this. But, um, and there, if you want to view the last couple years, the series of sculptures, they're at artcyclespartanburg.org. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. My name is Danielle Whitmore Thomas. Um, I represent YOLO Arts, which is, yes, if you're hip, it means you only live once. Um, but it's actually a, a, a local Patlin tribal name. And it is the name of the county that I represent. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Art and Ag project. And I want to um, just extend, first of all, extend a thank you to Ten at the Top and to everyone here for bringing us here. I also think the student who found us should, uh, deserves extra credit. <laughs> it ain't easy to find you county. Um, can I start? I'm going to start with a couple of really quick questions. I'd like somebody in the audience to identify who is an artist that is known for their landscape photography, black and white? All right. <laughs> I have a couple of prizes. I get to choose. Um, who answered that question first? The mayor. The mayor did, of course. <laughs> um, the second, oops, I'm going to have to run this back. The second question I have is, um, who here can name one of the top ten grossing cash crops in South Carolina? Peaches. Peaches. <laughs> so, the, the Art and Ag Project, which is also known as Art and Agriculture, is a project that I can actually say is brilliant because I didn't devise it. It was actually a grassroots program that came from a farmer and an artist. Um, and so she started this program mostly to get the artists off of the roadside and onto private <coughs> land. Yellow County is a leader in land preservation. We are, it has been, will always be our um, major economy. We grow everything from cattle to grapes. Um, and so this has been really important to um, our county to devise a way to infuse the arts into the local economy. So in short, we host 20 farm visits a year for artists. The farmers uh, are with mostly private land. We work with the land trust and our local farm to fork initiative. So those are our two big partners. So we open up farms, artists are able to get onto the land, they learn about the farms, they learn what farmers do, they, they get a greater appreciation for where the local food comes from and um, the value of preserving our farmlands. We host master art, artist workshops three times a year, and once a year we celebrate the whole thing in a, in a big huge exhibition that where the artists bring the work that they've created on the farmlands. Three years ago, when I saw this exhibition, um, I went to the Ag Commissioner and said, we've got to do a little bit more with this. 
So now we have pulled in the foods and the wines in our county. So it's really become a celebration of the bounty that is Yolo County. This is a great picture. It's an artist and a farmer, and they harvested the work off the wall every year. It's a big, huge raffle, and it could end up being a bloodbath, but so far we're doing pretty good. <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a showcase of where some of our local um, farms are presenting their work, presenting their food, their creativity. And three years ago, I called the Ag Commissioner. He's become our new partner. And he said, why do I want to meet with the Art Council? I don't really, I'm the Ag Commissioner. I said, give me 20 minutes and you'll understand it. And he not only did, but we found out that he's an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes out on the farm with this. So it's a great connectivity. It's an opportunity. We've got lots of public art that has been presented. We've created a one-of-a-kind website that is Art, Food, Wine, and Community, first ever of its kind. And we've been able to really showcase the organization throughout the way. This is some of our public art. Um, we've been featured nationally. And the, our, biggest, our biggest kudo was last year when the, uh, the then chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rafa Lansman, came to visit us and really um, put a spotlight on the project. So I welcome your questions in the, in the workshop. We see our crusty farmers painting some public art. And um, I really look forward to answering your questions. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present your project. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Doreen Moore, and um, I'm trying to figure out how do I start this next. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is not part of my five minutes I'm, this, um, while they're setting me up. Oh, they got me set up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm Doreen Bolt with the City of Rock Hill, and I am the leading city coordinator. And before you get excited about uh, gardening or landscaping, it has absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> Actually, we can see this, um, not art, but we can see this, um, a concept that was introduced from the uh, federal government, the Justice Department, it was an initiative to weed out drugs, crime, and violence, and uh, gang activity in communities, and to see back in human and social programs. Uh, it is an effort between the Rock Hill City Police Department and the Neighborhood Empowerment Office, which I work with. We focus on five neighborhoods. Um, the five neighborhoods actually made up about 4% of the city's total population, but 27% of the crime was happening in these communities, which, which gave us the designation as a weed and seed um, site. We received that designation in 2004. And in 2006, we received funding from the federal government uh, to go through for our weeding goals. Weeding goals, of course, was to reduce drugs, crime, violence. Uh, and we did that through the drug strategy, where we called in um, those who were selling drugs or dealing drugs on the sh in open market on the streets, and we offered them an uh, alternative. They could um, there there were cases that were built against them, but those cases would not move into court if they would give up that uh, vocation and go into something <laughs> <laughs> and go and go into something like. Um, and an education through a public school or a community college or a college, uh, I did something else. And as long as they did not continue to do this, they would, those charges would not uh, be held against them. But if they didn't, then it would cause, you know, to be brought back into court and be fast-tracked through the court system. Through the Weed and Seed efforts, we saw a 57% uh, decrease in violent crime. Um, we also saw other decreases that I'd be glad to tell you about during our breakout session. We uh, uh, <clears throat> included neighborhood canvassing as, as part of the weeding efforts. Our city efforts work with numerous um, collaborations and organizations to develop programs for our youth to increase participation of residents in the area. Uh, it was actually a community uh, effort. It was an initiative more so than a program because when programs end, when the money ends, programs end sometimes. But when you have an initiative, you have people working together, and when the and you can work on something that's sustainable for your community. So when the funding ended, which our funding did, um, then you are able to continue with that. And so we had after-school programs, we had um, different.
different um, community projects going on and organizations working with us to make sure that we were able to sustain that. The funding did end in 2011, and the city did kick in some funding for our weeded and our seeded efforts. And then um, we have also applied for additional funding. So since that time, we have actually uh, increased the number of neighborhoods that we are working with, even after the funding. We now have seven neighborhoods, and I'll tell you how we sustain the net when we have our breakouts. I know you want to hear all about that, so see me at the breakout. Thank you. <laughs> Morning, I thought there was somebody else on the floor for me, but I guess I'm going there. Um, I'm Britt Poole, I'm the town administrator for Lexington, South Carolina, um, which uh, is about two hours from here. Um, and I'm going to talk about Character Park, which is a really small park. It's the smallest park that we have in the town of Lexington, but I think it has had the largest impact of any of our parks. It's a great story. Um, this is a, a view of the park. This is what the park used to be. This was a convenience store. Um, it's in the heart of a low to moderate income area, uh, right on the, the main strip, mostly surrounded by residential. And the owner of this convenience store decided that he could make a lot more money selling drugs than he could uh, cokes. So he started, um, started doing that. And we worked with the DEA, our police department, and um, arrested him, stopped that operation, and um, the day the federal agency seized the property. It took us about four years, but we got that property turned back over to the town. Um, that's a long and complicated process. I'll be glad to talk about it if anybody has any questions about it um, once we go into the breakout sessions. The, uh, this is the first pocket park that the town did. It's only half, a, half an acre, um, but we really crammed in a lot of good stuff in there. It serves uh, West Lexington. Like I said, it's a low to moderate income area, and um, it's close to health care facilities. There's a public school about a block away, and like I said, it's pretty much completely surrounded by homes and uh, residential. The goals of this project were to redevelop the property. Obviously, it had been a blight on the community, and we wanted to make it a, a positive for the community, and also, Character's not spelled wrong. I'll talk a minute about, um, in a few minutes, about um, Willie B. Character, who the park is named after, and it was, the purpose of the park was also to, to honor Mr. Character. He was a, a prominent African-American community leader. He was called the mayor of West Lexington. He never actually held any elected office, but he, he was a school teacher and would hold court, as his daughter likes to say, on their front porch every evening and kind of solve the, the problems of the community. And um, he, he really was, was a great person to, to focus on in, in the creation of this park because that's exactly what that community needed was a central point to gather around um, because they didn't really have any public space in their immediate area to gather around. Um, like I said, his, the philosophy of the park and also his, his personal philosophy was that local gathering place and, and also to provide a point of pride. These are some of the features of the playground. There's, um, uh, they, we got a committee together of the neighborhood, and they told us what they wanted and even helped design the park. And they wanted these spray fountains and picnic shelters, and I'll show you something neat about the picnic shelter in a few minutes. Um, this is the layout of the park. The picnic shelter is the big building in the middle, and you see the large concrete area in front of the picnic shelter. They wanted it set up like that so they could bring bands in, have them under the picnic shelter, kind of uses kind of the old town gazebo kind of concept, that, that those that remember that. Um, you can see it's a very small park, like I said, a half an acre, but it is fully used but beautiful. It doesn't look overly crowded. Lexington Town Council has a motto um, that they have asked staff to go by, and that is uh, building partnerships. Uh, the mayor and council wanted to build this park not only with the community involvement from the design aspect and what the citizens wanted, but they also wanted to involve the local businesses. And we developed a public-private partnership model to fund this. Um, the lead sponsor was Golden State Foods. And you can see up there they donated $40,000 and, and helped us uh, plant the, the beautiful grounds and do some of the work on the park. Our park staff, they helped with that and um, also provided all the food for the, the big grand opening 
event that we had. These are our additional sponsors, and you can see that 84% of the cost of this park was funded by Golden State Foods and these other these other partners. Um, and so that that really is a you know the community came together in more ways than one to, to put this park on. And we've got many parks in Lexington and, and have, have done others with sponsorship, but there's not a single park that I can say that looks as good today as the day it was over. Um, every park has vandalism. This park doesn't have vandalism. We haven't had to replace anything in this park. The community has really come together and made this their own. Um, and one of the things that, that, that they've done is at Christmas time, they take their own personal Christmas lights that they purchase and they come in and they decorate the park. And this was with no involvement from the city. This is just something they came up with. Um, they decorate the park and have a, have a lighting ceremony and the park's all lit up for the holidays. So that's the kind of impact that this park has had and we, we just think it's phenomenal. Got some contact information for the park director if anybody has any specific questions on the, um, you know, the, the, the makeup and what things are there. And of course I'll be around after to answer questions about the process. Um, thank you very much. My name is Sandy Thomas. I'm from Greensville, Massachusetts, and I was director of the Greenville Energy Park um, there. Let's see, which do I do to? Yeah, okay. So this is the park, um, and it came as an inspiration from our master plan. Our town plans about every 10 to 15 years, um, looking out into the future, what they want to have there. And one of the ideas that came up was a green space um, in downtown that was safe. We had prior to that gathered. Um, on our town common, which was not a very good place. We had traffic on three sides, and so it really didn't work as a safe environment for children. Um, certainly the board was concerned about that. Um, the inspiration came um, kind of as a, a collection of different pieces came together. I worked for the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association at that point, and it's a nonprofit organization that was looking for a permanent home. They had been renting space um, throughout the Northeast prior to that. At the same moment, the town of Greenfield was looking for this park, and, and then the third piece that came together is um, a landscape architect designer at the University of Massachusetts had developed this plan for this actual space. So those three pieces came together um, in a wonderful collaboration. Um, and it's owned by the town of Greenfield, but Nessie, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, um, had a theme in mind, which was renewable energy. That's what we taught about. And so we wanted to make sure that um, that whatever was in this three quarters acre park had to do with renewable energy and also provided um, a fun place for people to gather since we didn't have that. So to that end, we uh, wrote grants, we raised money, we had uh, hundreds of volunteers put this park together. If I hit this button, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Maybe make a Okay, my glasses on. That's good. There we go. Good. So, um, so this is a fun slide because what happens is this park is right between two active railroad um, tracks, and it's all freight at this point. At one point, there was a huge railroad station there that um, was taken down in the 1960s. So it was a blighted area. So we're really reclaiming an area in the heart of downtown. And what happens is we have we built this amazing structure with volunteers. Um, and we raised about $90,000 to build about a $250,000 structure. And one of those things we did was because we're a Renewable Energy Association, we had a Prius donated um, by the um, Toyota of New England, and we raised about $30,000 with that and got a very happy winner. <laughs> and, um, and then we created this amazing um, uh, uh, train station uh, public, um, sorry, performing arts center. Um, we have weddings there, the mayoral inauguration is there, um, we have about 30 to 40 events every year at this site, um, and mostly in the summer. Um, we've had bicycles, um, cycling seems to be a big uh, topic today, and so we've had lots of um, different kinds of topics there. This is our sunflower seed contest, along with the fiddler's contest, um, that happens every fall in honor of a, a former resident who lived there. and. Um, Here's a little girl bringing her sunflower, and she did win first prize for the tallest. <laughs> um, now this was a fun one because what happened here after we raised all this money, and we were supposed to spend $70,000 building this park, at the end of the day in 2007 we had raised by funds and actual volunteer hours a million three hundred thousand dollars. It was amazing. So 
I'll end with this little story. So these performers are regionally um, very, very popular, as you can see. And the, the woman on the right said, as she, after she had sung the song, she said the oddest thing happened. As she was singing, t-shirts were dropping from the sky. What happened was the balloon, it was the kickoff for our annual balloon festival, and so a balloon was going by throwing out t-shirts to promote the festival. And she said she never had, she thought people were clapping, they thought she you know, loved her song. And she said, no, it was these t-shirts dropping from the sky. <laughs> So anyway, that's, um, I'll be in the breakout session if you want to learn more about what we did. And uh, we're so happy to be here. Thank you so much. And thanks to Roger Michael. Is he here? He's the one who found us. We had no idea how on earth you found us up in Massachusetts. But um, thanks to USC and to, um, to Abe's students for, for bringing us all together. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Wayne McCall. I'm the mayor of the city of Travis Rest. And in the words of the great President Ronald Reagan, I'm here to help you. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our downtown revitalization project that, uh, that we have uh, had going on in Travis Rest for a few years now. First of all, how many people in the room have actually heard of Travis Rest? Now, how many people have actually been there? Oh, that's great, I'll tell you. Oops. Here we go. Oh, you got Okay, great. <laughs> that was, a, that was, that was a, a, a bang for me to, uh, to be able to do this. I'm, I'm a, I'm a hands-on kind of person. I, we have people, trust me, that we hire to do this sort of thing. So if I mess up, you can hold it against me. The, I ask you, how many people have actually been there? Now, I'm going to back up a little bit. How many people have been to Travelers Rest 10 to 12 years ago? Mm -hmm. they, they, yeah, very few. Does it look any different today than it did then? This is a this this is a little sign from our entrance way here. Welcoming you to our team. Oops. Let's see. There we go. That's the gazebo there. That's part of what it looks like now. How did we get started in this? Our downtown was basically dead. So we had a four-lane highway going through the middle of town. We were a bedroom community of the city of Greenville. We were just a racetrack to get to work every day. We were losing money. Our businesses were closing up. So those of us on council, we decided, you know, if we're going to live here, if we're going to take stock in our community, we've got to do something about this. So we decided that we were going to narrow the road and to me, that was inconceivable. I grew up in the town. I remember when it was a two-lane road. Why do we want to go from a two-lane to a four-lane now back to a two-lane? That was, that was way above my, my region. Let me tell you something. Elected officials, if you're out there, if you're wrong, don't be afraid to admit and say that I messed up. I dropped the ball. Listen to people that, 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 you know, listen to people that are professionals in, 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 the, in, 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 the, in the area of what you're trying to do. So we get together, we get together, city council. We work with our business association, which I'm now proud to say has morphed into a full-fledged chamber of commerce. We did a little study. We had some folks come in and, and see what, uh, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of study that, that, that would be beneficial to our area. And so what we decided to do, I, 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 there we go, I, I apologize. We partnered, we in the city, we partnered with the uh, Legislative Delegation Transportation Committee. That's the people that authorize C funds. I spoke with a young lady last night who was a council member in a town close by here, and she had no idea what C funds were. Is everybody in here that's elected, do you know what C funds are? You know how to get them? All you gotta do is ask for them. You put your stuff together, Larry Greens, the State Transportation Commissioner, he, he told me, he said, listen, he said, I'm going to tell you, he said, you'd be surprised how many people don't know what C-Funds are. You, that's your money. You have to go in and ask for it. So we partnered with some folks, that being the uh, Transportation Delegation. We partnered uh, with the Greenville County Redevelopment Authority, used facade improvement money to, uh, to come in and redo our, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, blighted areas. The Swamp Rabbit Trail, okay, that's a whole, we could have a whole other conversation on that. We use that. 
to uh, to, to bring uh, a lot of a lot of folks in on the on the thing. TIF, we have a TIF district set up, tax increment financing. Uh, like like the thing said, we had sponsorships, we had we had magnum rights, we had when we, we went in and put some new uh, some new light poles out. We sponsored two thousand dollars. You can have your name put on a light pole forever. The uh, oh, I don't seem like that scrub either. Okay, we're getting kind of close to the end there, and I, I could, those of you that know me, I could sit up here and talk to you forever about this. And let me just say this, and I will close that this downtown project was a municipal association of South Carolina award-winning project. So anyway, uh, that being said, I do have some, some handouts. Uh, we have our conceptual master plan. I have, I have some copies of that. If anybody's interested in that, I'll be more than happy to give you, give you that uh, after the thing. But what I'd like for you to do, really, is I would love for all the folks that, that haven't been there, I want you to come see us. And the folks that have, I want you to come back. That's the main thing. So thank you for your time, and I'll be talking to you later. Okay, I'm going to talk real fast about the Better Block Project, a project that we started in Dallas, Texas, in my little community of Oak Cliff, which is just about a mile from downtown, often referred to as the bad part of town to most folks that lived in Dallas. So, um, really kind of this project started by me going to uh, Europe and seeing these amazing public spaces full of uh, plazas with live seniors, children, uh, these great small spaces that had uh, small businesses that could constantly be re uh, reutilizing these spaces and just a lot of life and energy and these places have been around for thousands of years so so I got back to Dallas and thought well what was it we're building what's going to be our legacy what are the things that we're you know putting out there for our future generations and I saw a lot of these things um, we were spending billions on them. so I had a hard time trying to figure out where am I going to where am I going to put my water fountain here and I'm going to ride with my grandchild someday on a bicycle um, so uh, another issue that we were faced with though too is that we were uh, told that we didn't have a culture for uh, kind of an outdoor lifestyle, for walkability and bicycling and things like that. And we were, first of all, we were told we're too hot. Second of all, we're told we're a car culture, everyone drives here. Um, and to make things even worse, we were doing a lot of planning. And you know, you're involved with any cities, you see lots of plans. And we've had these plans over the 2035 mobility plan, which to a lot of people was this idea of like, we're gonna have a great city in 2035. <laughs> so anyways, my, our ideas were like, well, how do we fix places not 30 years, but in 30 days? How do we make places that are destinations for our communities now? And not just focus on the downtowns, but focus on the neighborhoods and creating little neighborhood centers. Uh, I took an old row of buildings in my community uh, after I did several projects, actually. Uh, this was a, a street that had returned to a one-way in the 70s. Now, this is, again, in this kind of an inner-city suburb neighborhood, what we call a streetcar suburb. Um, these old buildings were mostly vacant. Uh, again, the street turned into a one-way street, widened, landscaping removed, sidewalks were thin, uh, just very little life. The buildings were vacant for years. Uh, when we started looking at the problems for the area uh, in order to make this more of a destination, we realized that the city created a ton of ordinances uh, 50 years ago that made, made it overly expensive to put out sidewalk, uh, sidewalk cafes for $1,000 minimum. Uh, arcade shading features for $1,000 minimum per window. Uh, you know, flowers on the sidewalk were $1,000, you know, uh, you know, crowds weren't allowed to gather. Uh, and, and, and you couldn't put, you couldn't put merchandise on the sidewalk, so those little book stalls and all the cool things that you see in those great places were just not allowed. So, we decided to take a weekend and, and, and take a block and see if we could break every law we possibly could. <laughs> and, and so we did. We took the street and we uh, painted our own bike lanes. We thinned it. We had a cafe seating. We took those old vacant buildings and we created the different businesses we wish we had. Coffee shops, flower shops, gift markets. We turned an old car garage into a kid's art studio and uh, space. The amazing thing about the project is we just we killed it all up over a weekend. What happened afterwards, within days, we had a, a, business, a little local business that stayed uh, with the two, two uh, girls in the area that were passionate about kids. They kept that, that little car garage open, and now it's become an anchor for that area. All those places that were vacant before within, uh, within months became leased and are used now. We also got public funds directed directly to the area now. Uh, there's about a million dollars to do public space improvements because we were able to show the potential for those spaces. So that 30-year process for fixing an area, we whittled it down to about to, to days. And, 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 and people ask it, and so, so we thought, you know, people said, well, you did it in the spring, it will never work in the summer, it's too hot in Dallas, let's see what happens here. 
So we take another street similar. We decide to go as 100 degrees outside. You know, overly wide street. Or this is a street that has gray, non-contiguous sidewalks. Businesses that were going vacant all the time. I had a pole with nothing on it. Just random things. So, so we came in here and uh, we brought in 42 trees, 100 bushes in order to create uh, 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 pedestrian spaces. We took a little reclaimed pallets and turned them into decks. Um, we painted our own crosswalks. You're really not supposed to do that. Bicycles, the poles, and then art. We put, uh, and then what was interesting was 100 degrees outside, people came in droves. And we, you know, when you have trees, even at 100 degrees, it drops that temperature below the trees so it makes shade. So these businesses that were in the area that existed were tripling their, their, their economics in the area. We also had, this is, I love this picture, we had lingering fatigue. We call this, this is some Photoshop renderings of how cool this could be, but these are, this is real, this is a Photoshop. <laughs> real trees, real sky, real crosswalks. Uh, <laughs> uh, just real fast, kind of the byproduct of this was the businesses that were there kind of got what we were trying to do and decided to make a more pedestrian uh, friendly space. Uh, so this has bars on the windows you can see, so it feels like a jailhouse, weeds everywhere. Businesses came in here and said, why don't we create more attractive spaces, kill the bars off, made an outdoor seating setting, they got it within days. Uh, we had vacant spaces that had been vacant for 10 years that were leased within, within months. Uh, now this is kind of our local uh, craft beer and wine shop. Uh, this little better block project that we started in 2010 has now gone viral, it's all over the country. We don't necessarily do them all, but we do help a lot of them. It's actually gone around the world, but there was one in Tehran, Iran, just two months ago. So, uh, so and in fact, I'll be in Australia next month, where they've got four going on there, and then we'll be in Denmark. So it's, it's everywhere, and it's on all the problems we face. Again, uh, one of the kind of, the two big things I want to talk about, so I was asked to kind of address the, the financial side and, and how we get things done. First of all, you'd be amazed at how little money we use to do these projects. We do them in days. Uh, we, we, we beg and we borrow, uh, and since it's temporary, we can do that. Uh, and it actually facilitates more social capital because people start communicating more. Uh, so that's the key to our efforts. Also, we found if you take a zero away from your budget, you get major creativity. You take two zeros away from your budget, you get sustainability and innovation. So uh, we drive forward with our projects, we publish them, we say that we're going to put them out there and see what happens, and we think innovation occurs. The way you get things done when you don't have money, you bring as many resources to the table as possible, as many people, as many organizations, as many things to you at the table and give them all a slice of the, of the block and have them help uh, with the project. And that's it. Um, okay, we're going to wrap up now. Um, again, I'm Nancy Whitworth and I'm with the City of Greenville. I just kind of want to um, give you a little bit about how the transformation of Greenville, just to kind of set the stage for kind of bringing some of what everyone else here was talking about. There's a lot of similarities. I want to talk a little bit about, we did not have a very attractive downtown, as you can see, but the one thing we had back in the 60s, we had people. And at the end of the day, that's what you really want to do, is try to figure out a way, which I think was the theme that a lot of our speakers had, is making it a place where people want to be. Now, when you took away the people, you can see we did not have a very attractive downtown. We also had four lanes of moving traffic, parallel parking, and the only trees that we had were potted trees. It didn't matter when you had people. You didn't see it. But when you took that away, it made a huge difference. So we narrowed down the sidewalk, planted trees. That was the early, and this is what it is today. That's where the storefronts then. This is the storefronts now. But the thing I want to talk about, there are, there are some big projects that have been done in Greenville. Um, and those have been important, don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, it's those small things that add up to make a place place where you want to be. It's the creating that sense of place through art. And it doesn't have to be expensive art. We have bells in the trees, we have quotes in the sidewalks, we have things that will engage people. We have, you know, we spend time talking about our uh, trash cans and our uh, benches, things, again, we think about our downtown as the place where it's our front, it's, it, it's our living room where people come into. We look at our signage and how we can do creative signage. Um, we try to focus on making it uh, a pedestrian experience. Planting of the flowers. Uh, fortunately, we don't have all of the rules regulated that you had to deal with. Those are, those are very interesting. We do permit it, but we don't really charge anybody for this space because we want the active engagement. Um, we want people to have interesting storefronts, not just for the vitality of the retail, but again, to make it an interesting place for people to be. 
the outdoor dining. Um, gratuitously, in this part of the, the country, we have weather that allows us to be outside very comfortably and being able to use that public space uh, for dining. We also had, and this is also about looking at your assets, whatever it may be, we had a park in downtown. That's what it looked like in the 60s up above. This is right off of our main street. And again, you can see a little bit of the, the revitalization that took place. And this was in a partnership with a garden club. It was a garden club who stepped forward to really lead the effort, both financially and publicly, to try to transform this park. We had a waterfalls in downtown right off Main Street. But we very creatively, back in the 60s, built a road um, and a bridge that covered, um, absolutely covered. But you know what? Nobody went there anyway. It was not a place to be. So a few years ago, we took that bridge down, you can see there, and transformed it back into a park, put in a pedestrian-oriented um, bridge, again, to, to incorporate that space and use it for things like weddings and Shakespeare in the park and arts um, classes. There is a governor's school for the arts, and that's their playground. That's the area they come out into for their inspiration using that space. We find spaces in downtown that we can use for fun things like this This happens to be an ice skating rink uh, that's privately funded um, in a private space that again creates an opportunity to bring people into your, into your downtown. As the mayor was talking about trails, one of the most important things that the city of Greenville participated with the county and along with TR, our, our sister city to the north of us, is a trail connection. I cannot tell you how important and significant that has been, not just for Greenville, but also for Travelers West. Incredible. And you know what, at the end of the day, these things are not that expensive. It's again, finding that place where you can look in your communities. It's enhancing public space. If you don't get it right the first time, or the second time, or the third time, you know, try it again. Um, this is one of our major piazzas in downtown. Um, I've been in the city for a number of years. This is our fourth renovation of this space. Hopefully, we got it right this time. So I think at the end, I, I just want to kind of leave this with you. Is really, it's about looking at your assets and the uniqueness of each of your communities and figuring out what is it that's special about what you have. We had a river. Actually, I grew up on a farm. This river would be what my father would call a creek. It was never really a river, but it was something that we could grasp onto and use that. Um, the details, so important. Again, not that expensive, but things to look at to make it a place. Um, be willing to take some risk. Love the risk of, you know, just do it. You know, just do it and then see what happens. So important. Um, commitment, it does take for a long-term sustained, vibrant city of a place. It does take some time and it takes patience. Uh, to make sure that, that you are committed in the long haul. And again, it's focusing on the people, focusing on things that make it a, again, an enjoyable, fun place to be. And of course, this is where you all come in because it, it, it's about leadership. And you know, vision is important, but you must be able to convert that vision into reality. And so it takes all of you and this is what we want to leave with you before we break into uh, the work sessions is an opportunity to take an idea in your community and serve as that leader to transform, to sustain, to just do some fun things uh, based on some of these great ideas that, that our wonderful speakers have provided for us.